Welcome back to ENAE788M, Hands-on Automatic Aerial Robotics. Today we'll be talking about one of the most important topics which you would need to control a quad rotor. So let's directly dive into the topic to get a high level pitch. So let's say that you have a quad rotor as shown in this uh, figure and you want to follow a trajectory RT as shown here. Note that this trajectory is a time parameterized quantity. So to follow this trajectory, your quad rotor needs to follow a set of poses at different time. The black trajectory RT here is the ideal trajectory you want to follow. And we have the body fixed frames as shown in blue. And we have something called our desired, which is basically the desired value, which would be the output of the controller, which we'll be talking about during the end of the lecture. Note that the R is the current position of the quad rotor and the vector V desired minus R, which is shown in red, that denotes the error in position with respect to the idle trajectory. So in this lecture, we learn how do we follow the fixed trajectory like these. Before we start deriving the equations of a quad rotor controller, Let's understand the basics of the controls in general. So let's start with the root locus plot. It's a plot of some system parameters that depicts how stable or unstable your system is. We can comment on the stability of the system just by looking at the positions of zeros and poles in a root locus plot. We'll talk about these terms in the next slide. So this slide is a big miss. So for now, just focus on X and the Y axis. So the idea here is that uh, you have the real axis on the X axis and you have the imaginary one on the Y axis. And this diagram is called the S plane. This S plane is uh, analogous to the frequency domain in the Fourier analysis, but it's slightly different. So I'm not going into the mathematical details but just remember this, that it's called the S-plane with the horizontal being the real and vertical being the imaginary. That's what we need for now. So let's focus on the plot on the right hand side of the plane. So you see that anything with X part or the real part means positive. That means that the system is unstable, which means that your output uh, of the system diverges for any step input. Now, for the left side of the system, where the real part is negative, your system is stable. That is, your oscillations are decayed. Anything which lies on the imaginary axis or the y-axis, the system is called critically stable or marginally stable. And such system would oscillate without diverging. So one of the most important thing about this plot is that anything that has X mark is called a pole and anything which has zero, which is uh, not shown in the figure by the way, is called a zero. And we get a root locus plot by the way these things move. And we saw one in the previous slide, right? So the idea here is that as you move from imaginary axis zero towards the left hand side, the frequency of the oscillation increases. And also if the pole has some imaginary component, uh, which on the X axis, it would always have some oscillation associated with it, like as shown in this figure. So it's just a decay for the left hand side and just an explanation, uh, exponential increase for the right hand side. In any pair of poles, which are shown with dotted lines here, exist as complementary filters, and they have an oscillation associated with them. So this is a general intuition how poles and zeros are formed, or how the root locus diagram is created. So root locus is just a figure that changes with a moment in zeros and poles with respect to the different changes in the system. So the main thing here is to learn that the S-plane diagram 
uh, is your left hand side is stable and the right hand side right hand side is unstable and y axis is critically stable also if you have a time delay in your system it will force your poles to shift in the right direction which would affect your system's liability or stability as it's moving towards the more unstable re uh, region of the s plane so that's the basics of what your root locus diagram is and how the poles and zero affect the system so let's move on to the next topic so let's talk about the open loop system so consider a simple system as shown here so we have an input which gives us a certain output response so it's a system of stimulus system and response so these plants could be anything starting from as simple as a thermostat to control air conditioner maybe or it can be something complex like human robot or a quad rotor so mathematically we would say that the input is x of t the plant has some response g of t and it gives an output y of t where t is time note that the capital x g and y representation are a function of s so this is a nice way of writing these function in laplacian or the frequency domain now consider a function g of s so this function can also be written in the time domain by simply simply taking a laplacian inverse of the function so if you're not familiar with last for a laplace transform please pause, pause the video and go through the laplace transform ones so coming back to the topic g of x is given as follows s plus 1 upon s square plus s plus 4 and since this is an open loop system there is absolutely no feedback and the total transfer function would be given by just g of s the pole zero plot if you want to plot which is shown on the left says that the function has two poles and only one zero which is donated by x and zero respectively so x is where the so x is where the denominator goes to zero and g of s doesn't exist at those points so the poles or the x is where the denominator goes to zero and your transfer function g of s does not exist at those points later in this lecture we'll see how these poles and zeros can be shifted towards the left hand side of the plot to make your system much more stable so coming to a closed loop system so in a closed loop system apart from the usual input plant and output we have a controller and a sensor the sensor provides the feedback from the output and computes the error or the difference using the input of the current state so this measured error is fed to the controller which is responsible for sending a control signal to the plant more formally or mathematically we can say that g1 is the controller which feeds u of t as the input to the plant g2 to produce an output y of t so this produces this output is sensed by the sensor h of t and thus the error is measured to input the controller again so if we have a sensor to sense the actual room temperature that could control the room temperature accurately and much more efficiently now this is the same equation as, as the last slide so we can now combine g1 and g2 which is the convolution of g1 and g2 so you can just combine this block into one block note that here all the functions here in are in the time domain now let's try to convert everything to laplacian so once we have a block where your g is g1 convolution g2 you can 
write this in a Laplacian form and know that everything is now capital. This is how we represent the Laplacians. So, and it's a very important property to know that that convolution in the time domain is a simple multiplication in the Laplacian domain. That's the property of Laplace transform. So if you don't know again what Laplacian transforms are, please pause the video, get familiarized with these topics and continue the lecture. So now let's start with a simple unity gain feedback control. So let's make H of S as a unit or one. So that means we are going to feed the exact output directly back into the input for the difference. So this is not very super, uh, this is not super common, but let's stick to this to make our lives a little more easier for now. So there are methods in control theory literature which can take a non-unity gain system with HS and convert it into a form where you can convert it into a unity feedback. So if you want to know more about this, you can read it later, which is which won't be covered in this topic anyways. So coming back to the example, we have G of S equals S, uh, G of S equals s plus 1 upon s squared plus s plus 4. Now because we have a unity feedback, our g total becomes gs all upon 1 plus gs. This is because the feedback, which is your denominator, which encompasses the entire forward block and a unity feedback. So your g total becomes s plus 1 upon s squared plus 2s plus 5. Now note that the position of zero remains the same because your forward loop didn't change, right? But if you see the position of your poles have changed. So let's compare the unity gain feedback with the open loop. So comparing these two cases, we can clearly see that the unity feedback in unity feedback, the poles are shifted towards the left hand side which means our system is much more stable, which proves the point that open loop controllers are worse in terms of stability than unity uh, gain feedback controls. So let's talk about a simple control system, which is proportional control or also known as P control, or sometimes even referred to as linear proportional controller because everything is assumed to be linear here. So note that I took the liberty to combine two blocks of controller and the plant into one because the controller just has a single gain KP and the plant has G of S, right? So we basically just combine them and roll them together. So note that, that we are still working with the unity uh, gain feedback system. That's why you don't see any H of S here. So same thing again we have g total equals kp gs upon 1 plus kp gs so let's say my kp is 2 you can choose anything but let's say for this case my kp is 2 that means my k uh, g total becomes 2s plus 2 upon s squared plus 3s plus 6 and now if you see the position of the poles and zeros the position of poles have shifted even further towards the left hand side if you compare with the unity feedback controller that makes that means our peak controller system right now has become much more stable than what we had with the unity feedback so pd control or proportional derivative control so adding a derivative term to proportional is also a way to make our uh, system more stable how do we do that? Let's see. So let's say if you have a gain called KD and if you convert your KD times S into time domain. So coming back to the point, we have a pro proportional term and a derivative term. If you have, if you convert KD times S, as you can see in this block, into time domain, you would see that it would be 
d by dt of the error signal which is basically in the laplacian domain as pd gains are Let's move to PT control or proportional derivative control. So we have a proportional term and we have a derivative term, right? So if you convert this KD times S into time domain, you would see that it would be D by DT of the error signal, which is basically in the Laplacian domain. So it simply becomes a direct multiplication. As uh, mentioned before, everything is clubbed and multiply directly and made into one block. So that's the beauty of this Laplacian. So you can finally write the block as KP plus KD times S into GS. So let's move on to an example. So we have G that uh, becomes KP plus KD times S into GS all upon one plus KP plus kd times s into gs so again you can choose your values of kp and kd to be let's say in this case 2 and 1 so your g total becomes s square plus 3s plus 2 upon 2s square plus 4s plus 6 note that in this case we have two zeros and two poles unlike all the previous cases where we had one zero and two poles so this system is a little unstable if you compare with the previous cases. This is because our PD gains are not very well tuned. For some different set of KP and KD, the controller will perform far better than the P control we had before. But if you have like a very good value of KP and KD, your impulse response would be better than the proportion system. So let's move on to the proportional integral derivative control, commonly known as a PID controller. So in this case, the idea is that we have a whole system, uh, whole system's function as KP plus KD time S plus KI divided by S. Here, divided by S means that it's an integral part of the error. So if we divide, if we bifurcate this equation, we can see that proportion is like KP into what your error is. Integral is KI into the integral of the error and derivative is like KD into the derivative of the error, right? So KI or the integral gain sees how the error has been varying over time. So the derivative part predicts that what the error is going to be in this momentum and the KP, the proportional part, simply linearly sees how far am I with respect to the error. Uh, let's take an example. So let's take an example, KP, uh, so let's take an example uh, where the same example basically. So our G total becomes for PID, uh, it becomes KP plus KD times S plus KI upon S into GS, whole upon one plus KP plus KD times S plus KI upon S whole times GS. So note that this equation will also choose a set of KP, KD and I. So for certain set of equations, our PID must be more stable than our PD controller or PI controller or just proportional controller. And it must be more stable than the open loop, open loop system or the unity gain feedback system. So we can always have badly tuned gains but that is not fair to con uh, to compare a badly tuned system of a PID system and compare with a well tuned proportional system. So now let's see an example. So note that the animation here shows you how the changing value of KP 
ki and kd would affect the system's response so i'm gonna pause for a second and let you watch and observe the value of kp ki and kd and how these change the values of these change the output response of your system So if you have observed that, you can see that when you increase the KP value, it made your system faster. So when I say faster, that means, let's say the red dotted line that you see, right? That's my ideal output, or in this case, I want to go from zero to one, right? So the time it takes to go to value one, if I have a higher KP, is much smaller. So in this case, if I have a KP5, I reach my goal in like 0.9 seconds. Versus if I have a KP1, I reach my goal in like 2 or 2.5 seconds. So we'll talk about these parameters more formally. But for now, let's try to understand more intuitively how these values of gain affect the output response. Now let's talk about what important parameters are. Uh, so now let's talk about what important parameters are there for tuning the gains of the system. So at time t equal to zero, we said that the output of the system should be one. So this is shown by the step input or the solid view line. But real world systems can't go from zero to one in infinitely small time, right? it needs some delta t times to basically respond to that value. So thus we define a few entities. One of them is called the rise time. So it's the amount of time that the system takes to go from 10% to 90% of the steady state value or the final value. Peak overshoot is the amount that the process variable overshoots the final value, generally expressed as a percentage of the final value. And settling time is the time required for a process variable to settle within a certain percentage, generally taken from like 2% to 5%, depending on, on what you're applying the PID controller to. And the steady state error is the final difference between the process variable and the set point. Note that the exact definition of these quantities will vary in industry and academia. So for quad rotor, it'll be 5%. For much more reliable system, like if you want a very fine green temperature controller, it'll be might be 2% or even less than a percent. So the way this is defined as you see the rise time that which starts at about 10% and the rise time stops at 90%, right? And then you see a peak overshoot of some value, which is some delta X higher than what your value should ideally be. And then you see there's a settling time where your system is about to converge with the idle value. And thus your steady state is achieved. So let's move on. So let's try to see the physical intuition of a PID controller for a quad order system. So let's say your quad order is currently at a position R of T, that is X, Y, and Z in space. And note that this is a time parameterized quantity. And your R desire is a desired state shown in yellow or the ghost quad order here. Say that this is one sample point of the series of sample points on a trajectory, right? So the error in the position would be equal to rt minus r desired and we have the velocities r dot and r dot desire right so as these vec as these, these are vectors we can say that we can compute error in velocity or e velocity as a function of time by using vector addition law and it's represented by a blue in this image so this error in velocity is related to the derivative term or KD term. So the integral terms measures amount of error changed over time. 
So let's say we have e position or error in position as a function of time, and we want to find the area under the curve. Take a moment, like pause the video for a while and think about what would be the scenario where the error in position will linearly increase like this. I'm not going to give you the answer. I'm not going to give you the answer for this. That's something for you to figure out and think about. So now let's move on and see some simulation stuff under different tuning parameters. So let's start with well-tuned well gains. Uh, here the quadrotor was commanded to go in a positive z direction by one meter. Note that there is a small overshoot before the peaks settle. So this is because we want our system to perform much faster and reach one as soon as possible. We're going to trade off the rise time with overshoot for a fast responsive controller. Also note that the time in the figure, which is 1.35 seconds, is the actual time that quad order took to go from z equal to 0 to z equal to 1. And that is different from the computation time of your solver. So don't confuse these two times. One is the computation time of your solver, which might be 10 seconds or even half a second, depending on how powerful your system is and how or which differential equation solver you're using. So the important thing to note is that the time you should be worried about is the time and the iteration number you can see in this image. So let's move to marginally stable system or also known as critically stable system. So remember in the root locus diagram, we saw the y-axis we talked about when your locus is at y-axis, then your system is marginally unstable or critically stable. So it's a system where it continues to oscillate for infinity, an infinite amount of time at some d units above and below the idle response. So let's first observe this, like what's going to happen. So now note that the system is only oscillating between zero and two like for infinite time. It's neither damping nor the oscillations are increasing. So this system is a marginally or critically stable system. And these values would change with chain in the gains. Now pause the video for a moment and think about what would this case be? Like why would a thing like this happen? So the answer is there was no derivative gain or KD used in this controller. So, or you can say that KD was zero. Now let's look at the unstable system. See how the quadrant is oscillating and how these oscillations are increasing over time. That's why you never ever tune the gains on the quadrant directly. It can be super dangerous and most likely will harm the quadrant and the surroundings. So the ideal way to do is to create a rough free model with a fair estimation of moment of inertia matrix and other parameters and try to tune your gains in simulation. So once you have some set of good uh, gains in simulation, use those gains to be a good starting point for your real quarter. And coming back to simulation out here, uh, why would you think that the oscillation are increasing over time? Like pause the video for a moment and think about it. So the answer is the derivative gain here, KD, is negative in this case. So the similar to the stable case, we have a trade off between settling time, fast response, uh, or time in overshoot. So this is very similar to what we had uh, in the example of good gains, or sorry, the example of the stable system. So for an over damp system, if you have a very high KD, your system might converge converge but the system uh, response will be very slow or sluggish so it's 1.9 second if you see as compared to 1.4 second in the previous uh, good gain scenario so this might be useful in some cases when you want to have a sluggish estimate let's say you have a very big quarter uh, very big quarter you want it to be safe but 
in some cases the sluggishness would be fine you don't want your quarter to be aggressive when it's a big one and it might hit something right so moving on to the underdown system so likewise if your kd is too high you will have a huge peak or overshoot and you will never want a response like this because the quad rotor will fly very far away from inside its uh, position so note that the rise time in this case is much lower than the all other cases so now let's see how we could tune these parameters manually so that's not one of the most simplest ways to do it but it's generally intuitive and that's why people like beauty controllers so if we increase any of these values that is kp kd and ki we see some effects on the parameters that if that is if we increase kp we see a drop in our rise time as we discussed before and kd doesn't not affect the rise time and if we increase ki that also decreases the rise time and as we increase kp the peak overshoot increases proportionally to kp so things like that so depending on your kp kd and ki the way you increase the values your rise time would increase decrease or might not have any effect but in case if you see if you increase the ki value the steady state will eventually be reached because with some non zero ki values you will have some sort of steady state at infinity at least so there's more formal method called Ziegler Knuckles method for tuning your P, P, D, P, I, or P, I, D controller. So for certain as oscillations, the time period T, U, we can find K, P, K, I, and K, D gains as a function of the ultimate gain K, U based on the above tactics. So again, there's no proof for these controllers or these methods, uh, but it's a general rule of thumb. Now let's look at a high level picture for a quarter of controller. So we have trajectory planner, which gives us the desired trajectory and we have a position controller. So what the, uh, the trajectory planner does is it sends a desired trajectory, which is denoted, let's say by Z desire. They send it to the position controller and this position controller send commands to the motor controller and your attitude controller. So the things you see on the slide in green is the part of the inner loop controller. And this thing on the left hand side, which you see in blue is a part of our uh, outer loop control. So generally you divide your controller, the quad rotor controller into two parts, inner loop and outer loop. And if you see that inner loop is running at about one to 10 kilohertz, whereas your outer loop is running at least 10 to 100 magnitudes times lesser, which is 10 to 100 hertz. So this entire high level picture representation that you're seeing in this, which has inner loop and outer loop, uh, which basically does attitude controller and position controller like this. So this is called backstepping. So this is one of the things that has been derived from the control theory and we are just using as this. So let's define a uh, nominal hover state. So the conditions are that your position of the quad rotor R is some R naught. That means your position of the quad rotor it is fixed. So next is your roll and pitch angle, which is theta and psi. They are approximately zero. That means if these are approximately zero, you can say that, that the cosine of these angles are one and the sine of these angles are the angle itself because of the small angle approximation. Another thing uh, to assume is that your change in position or your velocity of your core rotor must be zero and your roll pitch and your rates must be zero. So given these condition, your nominal hover state is achieved. And at this state, you can say that the net thrust of your core rotor uh, basically equals your weight of the core rotor. That means it's not moving, right? So you can say that your force equals mg by four. And you know that your force of each uh, propeller is also equal to kf times omega i square, which we learned in the previous lecture of quad rotor dynamics. So you can find that your omega or the angular velocity of each propeller must be under root mg times uh, mg upon four kf. 
and again we are using the standard Euler notation of Zxy. So coming back to the high, le high level picture again. So let's talk more about the attitude control. So if you recall the angular velocity omega b is defined as r uh, transport into r dot which is basically the body frame angular velocity. So for the uh, Euler angle zxy we can say that my body rate angular velocity equals yeah, we can say for each uh, degree of freedom uh, as pqr which is equal to your rotation metric which is cosine 0 minus cosine into sine 0 1 sine and sine 0 cosine uh, phi and cosine theta into your roll pitch and your rates so it is very important to know that that pqr are defined in the body frame whereas your roll pitch and your rate are defined in the world frame so let's talk about the attitude controller so so this is more about presenting an attitude controller to track trajectories in the special orthogonal group 3 or SO3 group that are close to the nominal hover state where the roll and pitch angles are small. So if you recall equations of the Eulers as we discussed in the last lecture, we can say that my moment of inertia matrix into roll pitch and your rate that is p dot q dot r dot equals my matrix which as l f2 minus f4 l f3 minus f1 and the sum of the differences of the opposite motors moments minus pqr cross i into pqr just we discussed in the last slide so if you assume that our quad rotor is symmetric over x and y that means my quad rotor if i draw a line from the top it's symmetric right so given this fact i can say that my moment of inertia along x axis and y axis are same that means my i can say that my i xx and i y y are same so using this fact and the above equations we can derive the following three equation which is i x x into p dot equals u2 x minus q times r into i z z minus i y y and similarly the, the other two equations and assuming that the angular velocity in my z direction or z body frame direction is very small then i can uh, compute that my p dot equals u2 x by i x x and similarly i can define my yaw rate and uh, pitch rate so if you recall we had a quantity called gamma which was equals to the ratio of the constants of force and moment which is gamma equals kf by km so we can just say that my p dot if i from the last slide i said it's u to x by i x s so i can just put u to x as l times f2 minus f4 so i can have basically the equation for roll pitch and body rates so if I consider it to be a nominal state or near, hover, near nominal hover state, I can define a PD control law, which can be given by this. So for P dot Q dot R dot, if I want to apply a PD controller, I can say that my U2 is P dot desire plus KP times what my error is, which is my phi desire minus phi plus KD time what my error is, which is P desire minus P. So similarly, we can define this for Q and R. Now, if we uh, talked about the dynamics lecture, we can say that my input U design, which can be calculated using gamma is equal to Kf by Km again. And I can basically use the matrix from dynamics, which is basically U desire equals Kf. Uh, the, the first row is Kf, the second row is 0 kfl 0 kfl and things like that and my second matrix would be the desired angular rates of each propeller so my u desire is basically a mixture of my u1 and q2 right so coming back to the position controller again the controller which runs basically 10 to 100 times magnitude lesser than the inner loop controller so 
this controller position control have basically two parts if you want to understand but the, the important thing to understand uh, before we dive into the position controller is that the attitude controller maintains the given attitude which basically in turn gi uh, is given by the position control so attitude controller is trying to control your role pitch and your rate and things like that position controller is trying to control your actual x y and z so that's why we call this a six degree of freedom or six of pose basically a pose has x y z and role picture so if i'm controlling my position add at and attitude i'm controlling my six of pose so this position controller can be thought of as an am amalgamation of both my hover and 3d trajectory controller so my what my hover controller does is it maintains that position of the desired x y and z so this can be done in two phases first we talked about the u1 which controls my position along my z axis with respect to the world frame and what my u2 does is if i just talk about x and y my u2 basically controls my roll and pitch angle and my z con uh, u2 z controls my yaw angle so in which direction i'm pointing to for example and 3d trajectory controller basically is trying to uh, create and track uh, the trajectory and let's say i want to follow from point a, uh, follow a trajectory from point a to point b but let's say it's not a straight line it's some curve right how do i know that how is the curve formed am i able to follow that curve with the given time let's say i want to complete that curve in 1.5 second for example it's a sine wave so am i able to track and keep the hold of that uh, trajectory so let's talk more about the hover controller so let's your rt and uh, 5t be the trajectory <coughs> so let's talk about the position controller so let rt 5t be the trajectory and the yaw angle we want to track and let's assume that these uh, So let RT and phi T be the trajectory and the yaw angle that we are trying to track. And let us assume that we are not at all changing our yaw. So my um, psi T is always some psi naught. It can be anything, right? So now if I talk about my uh, PID feedback loop, then we can say that the position error can be defined as my RIT minus RI. So if I want to calculate the RI desired, and write a PID for that, we can say that it is the difference that is ri, uh, ri double dot minus ri double dot desired plus kd times the difference in velocity plus kp times the difference in position plus ki times the difference, uh, the integral of the difference. If I say this is zero, that means it's a hover state, right? So this is how you write a position controller for a hover state. So here, when I'm saying I, I is defined for each of my X, Y, and Z. And also for my hover state, I can say that my velocity and the acceleration of the quadrotor must be zero. That means R dot and R double dot are zero. So coming back to the hover controller, we can also do So if you recall the Newton's equation of motion, you can say that basically force equal to ma, then we can say that mr double dot is equal to zero zero minus ng plus your rotation matrix from the body frame to the world frame into zero zero and net uh, sum of all forces, right? This we discussed in the dynamics lecture. So if you linearize this equation, you can say that my r1 double dot is r basic, basically which is for x axis. I can say that this is g times my delta theta desired into cos psi d plus delta phi desired plus sine phi d. And similarly for the y-axis, I can say that r2 double dot desired equals g times the delta theta desired into sine phi d minus delta phi desired into cos uh, psi d. 
and similarly I can say something about my SD direction as well. So now let's talk about a more simple error metric. Simple being in quotes because it's not that simple for the trajectory controller to track trajectories. So assume that the near hover assumption holds true. That is the angles are very small. So the idea is that we have the world frame as before denoted by red and we have the body frame denoted by blue as before and we want to measure the difference in error to the desired trajectory and see how much we have to correct it uh, by moving it on to the desired trajectory. So let's say that we have the R desired value as R desired in this case is the same thing as RT or at particular time instant T and we have the actual position as R. So let's say this position is obtained by some external localized system or we have running some onward algorithm to get these values. So more details about this will come on to the later projects in which you would estimate your own pose using the fundamentals of computer vision and a camera and you will uh, you would understand how this actually works but for now you can just assume that an oracle has given you this position or the orientation or vector uh, so literally we just take it every time instant we just measure the error so now pause for a minute and think about what the issues of this simple error metric can be So let's say we have a coordinator and we have an ideal trajectory like we want to go in the square but the criteria here is that we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't stop at the edges because we want to complete the trajectory in a, in a finite amount of time or as fast as possible right so we can have an aggressive tuned or over damped PID controller which would uh, give an undershoot output and maybe an under damped controller which would give us an overshoot output so both are not good, right? And we, if we get lucky and we, if we find an amazing set of proportional derivative and integral gains, we'd find a trajectory something like this. So notice that this realistic trajectory is still not perfect, but it's close to perfect. That's the issue with the simple error metric because you're always trying to play a cat and mouse game with the trajectory. And because if you if you are a little bit slow, you'll always be a little bit slower than the ideal trajectory. And if you're a little bit faster, then you will always be a little bit faster. And this will eventually accumulate over time unless you have a super set of amazing gains, which is a little hard to tune. And remember, every time you crash your code rotor, your gains will eventually change because your physical system has changed at least by a little amount, which can be considerable amount by colliding with the surface of the wall. So also these systems, the quadrotor system, uh, is not linear with the battery and voltage and things like that. So ideally you would uh, want a different set of gains for every volt and things like that, which is practically super hard to do. That's why we, uh, what we recommend is using a more fancier 3D trajectory controller, which basically calculates the error as projected on uh, to the normal and in binormal directions. So neglecting the ten tangent direction and only considering the normal and binormal direction, as shown here, right? So note that here B hat is not the same as the body frame. It's the binormal direction. So we'll define what it is. So uh, same world frame as before, the same des desired trajectory, and we have the coordinator at some position R and R desired, are um, here not the same as RT because your R desired is computed basically by dropping a perpendicular onto the plane made by the normal and the binormal terms. So normal and binormal terms are the two normal vectors to the tangential di uh, direction of your trajectory. What does this mean? Like this means that basically how much we are off in the normal and the binormal direction, not in the tangent direction, because the tangential direction has to do with the simple error matrix we talked about before. And the position in error is given just by these vector components projections and the summation of the normal and the binormal terms. So note that if needed, we can always weigh these terms in the error in the velocity 
and the velocity is literally the difference between the velocity vectors and the control command is given as follows so if you understand why uh, this happens yeah so so if you don't understand why this is happening please pause the video and think about the super intuitive control and make sure you understand all the directions and the binomial direction and the tangential direction of the trajectories so if you don't understand this please pause the video think about it uh, this uh, super intuitive trajectory controller so this is all the controls you would need to control a simple quadrotor which follows a near hover conditions or assumptions and execute simple trajectories and the, it is important to know that we are not doing any aggressive maneuvers here so for aggressive maneuvers we would need of course you need more non-linear controller which are not going to be uh, taught in this course but you have, feel free to uh, read about them one of the common ones you should know is the linear quadratic controller and linear quadratic regulator also known as lqr and lqg so and you can also use multiple pids at different state tunes and this is also called gain scheduling and they are more non-linear and adaptive controllers like uh, geometric controller is a very common one but that is beyond the scope of this course and you can always take courses like control theory and advanced control classes and learn about these models so you this is all uh, stuff that would you would need for uh, the project to, uh, two which would be basically following a certain fixed trajectories so make sure you go through the dynamics and controls lecture properly before starting the project two so that's for the quadrotor controls class uh, see you next time bye